QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Intertransaction purchasing equipment using bank feeds. Let's do it with Intuit QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in QuickBooks Desktop Bank Feed Practice File. We started up in a prior presentation going through the setup process we do every time. Maximize the home page to the gray area in the view drop down. We got the hide icon bar, open windows list checked off, open windows open on the left. We're going to open up the major financial statement reports in the reports drop down, going down to the company and financial starting out with the profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement. I'm gonna change the range to the area where my bank feeds are located for the year 010122 to 123122, and then customize the report so I can go to the fonts and numbers, change the font up. Let's bring it to 14. Okay, yes, and okay. Then the other major one, reports drop down company financial the balance sheet the balance sheet standard there's only one date range here so one date i'm going to go up to the customized reports so i can see the range so that when i drill down using the zoom feature i will have a range then 010122 to 123122 and then the fonts the numbers need to be changed up let's say to 14 okay yes and okay there's the balance sheet the income statement we're now going to be imagining we're using the bank feeds in order to record the purchase of property plant and equipment now just a quick recap if i go to the home page over here that well let me open up the bank feeds first if i go to the banking drop down bank feeds here's the bank feed center which would only be there if you have bank feeds set up which we did in a prior presentation maximizing this for some reason and unmaximizing it i don't know why it does that but i'll re-maximize it and then we've got our data down below i'm going to go into the unrecognized transactions now once again if i go to the home page then i'm really looking at transactions remember when you're entering the information into the bank feeds you're still going to be in essence using forms where applicable meaning quickbooks will default to a form we in essence are looking at those things that are going to be decreasing the checking account which quickbooks will usually use the form of a check form the check form not only being for those things that have an actual check with a check number in a written check but the form used for electronic transfers and so on that decrease the checking account the other side going to some other place normally when you enter a check like we did last time we're entering checks for expenses so the different types of things we pay for oftentimes will be expenses but if we purchase something that's very large we've got to be careful because we might have to put it on the books as an asset now note that if you're a small company then you, you might say, hey, look, I'm going to try to make everything on a cashed basis, and I'm going to try to base everything from the bank statements to create my financial statements. I don't want to do an accrual thing, which when we look at property, plants, and equipment is an accrual thing. But note that the property, plants, and equipment, the fixed assets are one area where you can't get away from doing some accrual components. So in other words, just to see what's going to happen here, if I go to the balance sheet, we're going to decrease the checking account the other side instead of going to the income statement profit and loss like we did last time is going to go to the balance sheet in an asset area called fixed assets which could also be known as property plants and equipment pp and e depreciable assets you have to do that for taxes if nothing else because the tax code is going to make you do that when you make large purchases so then the question is well how can i set up my bank feeds to account for these large purchases. One way you might do it is you might try to set up like a dollar restriction and say, hey, look, if I purchase something that's greater than a certain dollar amount, you might wanna make a rule to put that to another account or at least check it a little bit differently. 
uh, so that she can pick up those those fixed asset items, give them to the accountant possibly at the end of the year, and help them help you to calculate the depreciation related to it. So the general accounting would be, we're gonna put it on the books as an asset, and then we're gonna expense it over the time period that we use it in accordance with an accrual concept of and using accumulated depreciation and depreciation expense. So if I go to the lists drop down into our chart of accounts, if you had a chart of accounts set up by choosing an industry, they might give you a couple like property, plants and equipment accounts, but I would be very careful in first setting up your property, plants and equipment accounts because again, the subledger will not be done typically within QuickBooks as so much as outside of QuickBooks, usually in tax software, meaning the actual backup of your equipment, the list of equipment that you have and the depreciation per piece will typically be done on the tax software because you're going to have to do it on a tax basis anyways. And then you can also use the software to convert it to a book basis if you want. Therefore, you want to consult your accountant, your tax preparer or your software if you're doing your own taxes to try to tie together the accounts that you're setting up within QuickBooks to the same grouping that will be on the tax software and the depreciation schedules related to it. Keeping that in mind, we're then going to go then to the bank feeds and we'll set up uh, the, the account as we go. I'm going to sort it by the downloads. I'm going to look for an item I can use here. Let's just use one of these items. And so I'll, I'll use this one and pretend this is the purchase of uh, equipment. So it'll be much the same. It's still a decrease as we saw with the utilities in that we're still gonna have someone that we are paying that will usually be in like the memo. So I'm just gonna type in S-R-E-G-I-S. -E I'm gonna say tab. It's gonna ask me if I want to set that up. I'm gonna do a quick setup because it is a vendor once again. So I'm gonna do a quick setup. It will be a vendor. I'm gonna say, okay. And then in the accounts, if I don't have an account set up already, I could set up the account here by adding a new account or just typing the account in. This time I'll just say new account. And then I'm gonna call it the, I'm gonna call the account, let's just call it equipment. I'm gonna imagine that we're purchasing equipment. And then I'm not gonna put a description, a note. I don't need to assign a tax account. And so I'm gonna just keep it like that. But the key point here that I almost skipped is that it shouldn't be an expense account, which is the default account for a decrease. It should be an asset account. So it should be a fixed asset type of account going on the books as an asset. So notice that you gotta make sure to pick that up or else you're gonna assign it to the wrong account. So then I'm gonna say, okay, if I look at my chart of accounts now, just to see what happened, lists chart of accounts. Now we've got our equipment up here as the fixed asset account. Now, if you set it up wrong, you could change it by right clicking and edit the account and then change the account. You got to be careful but to do that, but normally, you know, it's not going to throw you out of balance or anything because QuickBooks will kind of still force you to be in balance, but it is a little tricky going from an, an expense account and try to change the whole thing up to a fixed asset. So you want to make sure you catch that kind of thing early. Uh, and then we're going to go back on over to, that's why you check every time you enter a transaction, check the financial statements to see that it does what you expect it to do. And so then I'm going to hit the drop down here and go to add more details because we're going to make a rule and also see the data input in this format. So if I look at it this way, uncategorized date, there's the item date up top, the memo, there's the payee that we set up, equipment is the account that we set it up to go to. Also just realize that when you're dealing with this information, you're going to have to give it to the tax preparer for them to calculate the tax depreciation and possibly the book depreciation. So you're going to want to put in your memo when you're tracking this stuff, what you purchased and you want to be as descriptive as possible. So if you purchase like three tractors or something like that, or, you know, or, you know, three forklifts or whatever, you're going to want to make sure that you can distinguish the three different forklifts, uh, in your in your memo so that when they put it on the tax records on the sub ledger they don't just report it on there as one lump sum for three forklifts instead putting it on there as three separate forklifts because if they put it on there as one lump sum then if you sell a forklift in the future it's going to be a problem because you're not going to be able to identify which one you sold on the sub ledger and you'll have to break it out to try to to try to account for the sub ledger so it will not be a problem at the beginning it will cause a problem later. 
So you wanna track what you're purchasing in detail. Make sure your accountant is preparing your depreciation schedules in detail, listing exactly what you purchased so that in the future, when you sell stuff and dispose of things, it'll go smoothly. All right, so then we're gonna go down and add a rule. So we're gonna add a rule. I'm gonna pull this to the right and the rule's gonna be, once again, I'll just call it uh, SA. I'm gonna stop saying once again, if that's bugging you. It's bugging me. I'm saying, stop saying once again. Okay, okay, I'm gonna stop. It's a money out rule. We're gonna say this time, we could say all or any. So this time I'm gonna keep it at all. And we'll talk more about like this kind of rule. If you have property planting equipment that might be over a certain dollar amount later, but just to give an idea of it, note that the person that we buy equipment from might be the same people we buy supplies from like, like an office supply store or something like that, an office depot. So you might say, okay, if I buy something that's below a certain dollar amount, I want the rule to be applying it to supplies expense. But if I have an item over a certain dollar amount, then I might want you to apply it to fixed assets. So you might say, add another rule in this case. And you might say, if the amount is over greater than whatever, 5,000, and wh what would that dollar amount be? Is there some kind of set rule? No, there, there's not. But general, the general idea would be that if something is relatively low in dollar amount, then then it's going to be immaterial to then put it on the books as a fixed asset. You might as well just expense it. Why? Because that's the easiest thing to do. If it's over a certain dollar amount, whatever dollar amount you think material or relevant to you, then you're going to use that dollar amount. And then it'll at least give you an idea that this thing is more likely that it should be on the books as an asset and depreciated, which is the more complex thing to do. The thing that needs to be done when you have a larger material item, just from a practical standpoint. So we'll talk more about that later. I won't do that right now. I'm just going to keep the singular rule as we've been working on, but apply it to an equipment account as opposed to an expense account. So this looks good. And then that looks good. So I'm going to save it. And then let's go ahead and here we've got, this looks good. So let's save it and uh, add to the register. So now it pulls it over here. So if I go to the added to the register items, notice last time I logged out. So when I go back in here, this is the only one I have. It doesn't save all the items that you added to the register. It's only in this current session that it adds them. And then in the recognized area, it pulled these other items into the recognized area here for the equipment. I'm not sure I'm gonna keep that there because we just kind of made it up. But if this was a reoccurring transaction, that could be quite useful because now it can save those and I can just add them quite quickly. Let's see what happens to the balance sheet, shall we? Shall we people? Balance sheet, checking account, double click in the checking account. We now see that we have the this amount going down for this check form. If I double click on it, it takes me once again to the check. I'm gonna stop saying that. It takes us to the check form as we have seen in the past. And it's gonna decrease the checking account, the other side going to the expense, closing this out, closing this out. And then the other side is in net income, looking at it from the balance sheet perspective, breaking out the income or equity section in the profit and loss. I'm sorry, it's not in net income. That would be if it was an expense, get with the program. We put it into the equipment, which is now under the category of fixed assets. If I double click on the equipment, there it is double clicking on that there it is the check so that's the difference here it didn't go into income when will it hit the income statement when we depreciate it allocating the expense to income when we consume the equipment would be the theory in accordance with the matching principle accrual kind of concept how would we do that how often would we do that possibly monthly if you're a small company possibly yearly how would you do the calculation? Most likely with the subledger, which would be done by the tax software, often done by a tax preparer. What kind of depreciation would you use? You might, if you're a small company, use simply tax depreciation, even though it's not the best for books purposes, but then you only have one set of depreciation schedules, or you might tell your accountant to, to also calculate the tax depreciation and book depreciation so you can use whatever you want straight line double declining whatever you think would be best for uh, book purposes 
how often do you, what do you how are you going to work with the tax preparer well because you don't purchase equipment all the time you whatever was purchased in the past the tax software will already have any new purchases you're going to have to give to the accountant possibly with just a sub ledger like this because these are big purchases you shouldn't have a lot of them but you want to make sure that you're giving all the detail to the tax preparer about those purchases and disposals so that they can keep a, a good accurate sub ledger that that can tie out to the actual equipment that you have so that when you sell them you don't have to break up multiple items on the sub ledger and so on okay closing that back out we also see that in the vendor section vendor drop down vendor center we've now added another vendor so we want to make sure that we are adding vendors because that gives us that other level of searchability if i have questions about who i paid and so on i might want to look at it by vendor as we have here okay so now also i'm just going to open up the trial balance counting taxes trial balance i think this is an under utilized report but quite useful so i want to just check it out from time to time oh one uh two two so what am i doing oh one oh one two two to twelve thirty one two two and then i'll customize it and go to the fonts and numbers changing the font let's bring this up to 16 so we can see it clearly okay yes okay this gives you the balance sheet and income statement accounts for a particular year in one area so that's really nice to be able to do the data input and then jump over and see what happened drilling down on this one report as opposed to jumping back and forth to a longer and more complex financial statements of profit and loss and the balance sheet also just note that there's another report just want to check in on if you go to the accounting and taxes and look at the uh, transaction list by date report and we go from 010122 to 123122 this gives you a list of transactions that we've entered thus far if you want to see them in journal entry format you can go to the reports drop down accounting taxes and the journal and i'm going to say okay from 010122 to 123122 now these two reports are quite good to check how much work you have done and act as a supervisor to someone else seeing what they have done and also you might bill based on these reports looking at the transactions or looking at the transactions including the complexity how many accounts were affected for example to to determine your billing range uh, for bookkeeping services as well